on Y News. President Rodrigo Duterte clarifies he did not appoint Vice President Lenny Robredo to a cabinet position despite being a drug czar. Lawmakers ask Senator Bongo to identify a former Philippine Olympic Committee official allegedly involved in corruption. NCRPO releases its list of items prohibited in SEA Games venues. At least four persons are injured and more than 100 houses got damaged after a 5.9 magnitude earthquake rocks Bukidnon. And Typhoon Ramon slows down as it approaches the Babuyan group of islands. Good evening. President Rodrigo Duterte clarifies he is not designating Vice President Lenny Robredo as a cabinet member despite her appointment as a drug czar. Malacanang says the Vice President's missteps have derailed President Duterte's intent for the VP to be part of the administration. Rosalie Cost reports why. I will swear her as uh, a cabinet member first, ulit siya, so that she will have the authority. Eh, alam mo, ang cabinet members are alter ego lang ng presidente yan. So, kung may go in ang cabinet member, it is as if it is mine. So, to make it legal, just uh, a little uh, fiat. Hindi na kailangan na mag ano pa ako sa Congress. I will just make her the, the cabinet member. Tapos, all drug cases and all, all things matter in connection with drugs. Iyon na yan. Hanggang katapusan. This is the statement of President Rodrigo Duterte days before formalizing his offer to Vice President Lenny Robredo as drug czar. The chief executive clarifies, however, he is not appointing VP Robredo a cabinet member despite her designation as co-chair of the Interagency Committee on Anti-Illegal Drugs, unlike his first statement. The president explains the two of them have different parties and he's not sure if the VP would not reveal to others what will be discussed in cabinet meetings. Meanwhile, presidential spokesperson Salvador Panelo confirms being drug czar is not a cabinet post and the vice president has made missteps. She made missteps, if I may call it, that registered red signs that cannot be ignored by the president. Among those missteps are talking with and seeking the advice of certain foreign institutions and personalities that have prejudged the campaign against illegal drugs as a violation of human rights, insisting on getting access to classified information and her tendency to be generous with acquired information to others. Secretary Panelo adds President Duterte has reservations or does not trust Robredo in relation to the classified information on the anti-drug war. Since she has talked with certain institutions and people that are supposed to be enemies of the state, to the mind of the president, that's a dangerous sign. If it's a mean, you may not be doing it purposely, but delicado. He already made a statement. Delicado yung ginagawa mo. Meanwhile, according to VP Robredo's camp, the administration's statements are confusing. Nonetheless, the Vice President will continue doing her job. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanã. Senators today asked Senator Bongo to identify the former Philippine Olympic Committee official allegedly involved in corruption. This is in connection with President Rodrigo Duterte's expression of doubt in letting the official manage the preparations for the upcoming SEA Games. Nel Maribohok clarifies why. Senator Christopher Bongo defends the Philippine Sports Commission's budget in the plenary. During the budget deliberation today, Senate Minority Leader Frank Lirindrilon asked Senator Go which official was President Rodrigo Duterte referring to as involved in corruption, so he had doubts of leaving the 2019 Southeast Asian Games preparations to the Philippine Olympic Committee or POC. So we're just wondering who are the people that the president had concluded could be dipping their dirty finger uh, into this uh, uh, preparation of our uh, Southeast Asian Games? Gusto mo malaman? 
Sino yun? Yes, yes, Mr. President. I think it's a legitimate one. Ibubulong ko mamaya sa'yo. According to Senator Goh, the official is from the POC. I think the President was referring to the previous leadership of the POC. And yun pa yung sinasabi ko na allergic siya. Senator Goh, however, did not confirm if he was referring to former POC President Jose Pepin Cojuanco. He said he will just leave the issue to President Duterte. The POC, the PSC, and the Philippine Southeast Asian Games Organizing Committee have been tasked to manage the preparations of the upcoming 2019 SEA Games the Philippines is hosting. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. House Speaker and Philippine Sea Games Organizing Committee Chair Alan Peter Cayetano should be held accountable for all issues relating to the Sea Games on November 30 to December 11. This is Malacanang's statement on the controversial 50 million peso worth of design and construction of the Stadium Cauldron for the 2019 Southeast Asian Games. Senate Minority Leader Franklin Drillon questioned this during the deliberation of the proposed 2020 budget on the Basis Conversion and Development Authority, or BCDA, yesterday, which he said could have been spent on 30 classrooms. Speaker Alan is accountable to all that relates to the SEA Games. Kung anong bully niya sa doon, siyempre siya dahil siya nagpapatakbo doon, siyempre accountable siya. But meanwhile, let's not bring that first. The National Capital Region Police Office reiterates bladed weapons, bottled drinks, and even large bags are prohibited in Southeast Asian Games venues. The Philippine National Police will also implement the suspension of the permit to carry firearms outside of residents in Metro Manila, Central Luzon, and Calabarzon beginning tomorrow. Lea Ilagan explains why. The National Capital Region Police Office, or NCRPO, has released the list of items prohibited inside the venues of the 2019 Southeast Asian or Sea Games. According to NCRPO Acting Director, Police Brigadier General Debold Sinas, these include bladed and pointed weapons, drinks in cans, bottles, and plastic containers, matches, lighters, cigarettes, fireworks, and flares, banners, flags, perfume, gas spray cans, folding chairs, ladders, and large bags. Including yung maliliit lang, yung mga nail cutters, kasama ang mga bawal. Tapos, uh, basta magamit na pangputol, pangstal, at saka mga pangpapalipan, bawal niya. Sinas odds aside from securing the billeting areas, venues, and roads, the police will also secure the most likely tourist spots like bars and clubs in Metro Manila. We request to the Philippine Organizing Committee to inform the police that the police will be able to get out. Then we will put the visibility there. Sinas also reminds the public about the suspension of permit to carry firearms outside of residence or PTC-4 in Metro Manila, Central Luzon and Calabarzon area from November 20 until December 12. Members of law enforcement units in civilian clothes and those off-duty are also not allowed to carry firearms. Sinas clarifies despite their busy schedule in the SEA Games preparations, they will not abandon other vital installations and places of convergence. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue, Camp Krame. The Basis Conversion and Development Authority finds the necessity for clinics and other medical facilities for athletes and delegates of the Southeast Asian Games. Dante Amento details why. The General Hospital Satellite for Sports Medicine and Wellness in New Clark City, Kappa Starlock opens today. It will be operational starting tomorrow as athletes from participating countries start to arrive for the 2019 Southeast Asian Games. Today, I believe that uh, we are sending doctors and nurses to take care of our athletes. And I know that you have the capability because we are dealing with the best. This Philippine General Hospital Polyclinic will take care of the athletes during the regional sports event. 
Some 300 doctors, nurses, and technicians from PGH Manila will work together for its round-the-clock operation. We will be uh, equipped to handle most emergencies um, that will not require hospitalization because it's a limited facility. After the SEA Games, the facility will be used by new Clark City residents and neighboring municipalities and provinces. Dan Diamento, UNTV News and Rescue. A former humbled Broncos ice hockey player's life changed forever when his team's bus collided with a lorry, leaving him paralyzed from the chest down. After undergoing experimental spinal surgery in Thailand, former humbled Bronco Ryan Strachinsky is making a remarkable recovery. Let's watch this report from our Thailand correspondent, Kath Dumaraos. 18 months ago, this horrifying scene shocked the world. 16 members and staff of the Canadian Humboldt Broncos Hockey Club died and 13 got injured when their bus was hit by a semi-truck that had blown through a stop sign. Ryan Stratznitsky, 20, was one of the injured Broncos. The fateful incident left him paralyzed from the chest down. Last month, Stretchnitsky and his family flew to Nantaburi, Thailand to undergo epidural stimulator surgery. The treatment is no miracle cure, but it is considered a breakthrough procedure that combined with intense physical therapy could improve the health and quality of the life of those with spinal cord injuries. And after undergoing experimental spinal surgery, Stretchnitsky is making a remarkable recovery. Strachnitsky says he now has the ability to control his core, has better sitting balance, and limited leg movement. Uh, as far as stem cell goes, I think it's uh, supposed to bring back a lot of, uh, you know, sensitive functions and, the, you know, how you're feeling and stuff. And, um, yeah, I think so far, so good, right? Post-surgery, he has five weeks of intensive physical therapy and a mapping process used to enable patients to control their muscles. Ryan added his experience opened up his eyes on the awareness of people with disabilities. And, you know, before just living a normal life, I didn't really think about it, but going around cities and different places around the world, you, you notice, start to notice the non-accessible places that people can't get into with wheelchairs or, or other disabilities. So I think bringing awareness to that is important and it can help out a lot of people. Recently, he has made it to the province of Alberta's para ice hockey team with ice set on Team Canada and the Winter Paralympics. I see him working hard every day, so uh, we're pretty proud of him on that. We bug each other a lot, so uh, I think that gets us through everything. Ryan sends a message to everyone who supported him and to those who are feeling hopeless in life. I think it's important to, to stay positive and look at that light at the end of the tunnel. No matter what, there's always going to be someone there to reach out to. You know, I'm pretty thankful for the support around the world. Kat Dumaraos, UNTV News and Rescue, Bangkok, Thailand. Welcome back to Y News. We pick up to where Angelo Castro III left off. I'm Alex Malbazar and here are the headlines. Signal number three raced over northern Cagayan. Thousands of residents evacuated. At least four persons are injured and more than 100 houses got damaged after a 5.9 magnitude earthquake rocks Bukidnon. Cultural group Pandai Sining strikes a new soiling the walls of Araulo High School in Manila City. Light Trail Manila Corporation launches its mobile app that provides real-time information to LRT1 riders. And the Department of Health reports that about 6 million Filipinos still lack access to clean toilets. Good evening. Regent Foods Corporation answers Pasig Mayor Vico Soros' Facebook post relative to the detention of 23 workers involved in a violent dispersal last November 9. The food company claims the workers violated their and several individuals' rights. My Bermudas will tell us why. 
Region Foods Corporation has issued its official statement in relation to the detention of 23 of its workers involved in a violent dispersal last November 9. According to the food company, they respect the sentiments of Pasig City Mayor Vico Soto in the same way they respect their workers to hold a peaceful protest. But such rights should be peaceful and in accordance with the law. According to Regent, contrary to what Mayor Vico knows, the protest is illegitimate and chaotic until the protesters were dispersed. Regent also claims the workers also violated the company's rights and several individuals' rights after a security guard was stabbed by one of those who participated in the picket. The company assures it will compensate affected workers. On Monday, 11 out of 23 detained employees were freed after posting bail. Mayor Soto vows to do everything under his will to free the said workers and underscores they are not criminals. My Bermudez, UNTV News and Rescue. Solons have urged Congress to swiftly pass the Alternative Work Arrangement Bill for the sake of the Filipino workforce. Sibak Party List Representative Brother Eddie Villanueva said the passage of the bill can promote work-life balance and reduce operating costs. The Sibak Solons filed House Bill 5471, which seeks to amend Article 83 of the Labor Code of the Philippines, where employers can voluntarily adjust their working hours per week requirement, but not beyond 48 hours per week without affecting the salary and benefits. The Light Rail Manila Corporation launches the first ever mobile application for LRT1 riders. The app boasts of many features, though the LRMC admits it's a work in progress. My Bermudas reports why. Real-time train arrivals, departures, fare, and even crowd monitoring in 20 LRT1 stations are just some features of the new and first-ever mobile app launched for the riders of the Light Rail Transit or LRT1. The mobile app called Ikot Manila can also be a communication tool for LRT1 riders to report train glitches or issues. Safety reminders and advisories from the LRT management can also be found here. Well, yung gusto namin i-address is yun nga is yung uh, parang yung seamless journey ng, ng passenger. So, at least pagdating yung sa station, alam niya kung ilang minutes darating yung train. No? Um, also, let's say, pag pwede siyang pumili between two stations, uh, makikita niya kung ano yung station na mas hindi crowded or siguro mas mabilis yung train. No? But since Ikot Manila is a new app, the LRMC admits its features and services should be improved further, such as the accuracy of its real-time updates. We uh, currently we have about 500,000 riders daily, so our target, initial target is 1%, but we have a mass of 1%, and then we'll go from there. So we appreciate your feedback, um, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. Um, also, we would appreciate so that you can continue to improve it. Through the app, the LRT management also aims to address issues on riders' commute since the holiday season is just around the corner. Ikot Manila app is downloadable through Google Play and App Store. My Bermudez, UNTV News & Rescue, Pasay City. A lawmaker is pushing for a ban on the use of e-cigarettes known as vapes in all public places across the country. Filed by Bagong Generacion Parley List Representative Bernadette Herrera D, House Bill 5510 prohibits the use of vapes in public areas such as schools and universities, public elevators and staircases, gas stations, oil and chemical storages and laboratories. It also pushes to ban vaping in hospital premises and health clinics, train and bus terminals, airports and seaports, restaurants and conference halls. The proposed measure is also pushed on limiting the sales of vapor products even in online sales platforms. Violators would have to pay from 1,000 pesos to 500,000 pesos in penalty plus jail term once the bill is enacted into law. Herrera D. filed the proposed measure following confirmation of the first patient acquiring vape-related ailment in the country. Tropical Storm Ramon brings strong winds and heavy rains over Cagayan Province. More than 1,000 families have been evacuated due to possible flash floods and landslides. Joe Anano tells us why. 
Various towns in Cagayan battle strong winds and occasional heavy rainfall as Tropical Storm Ramon hits the province. The towns of Santa Ana, Gonzaga, Apari and Abulug continue to experience the wrath of Typhoon Ramon. But Abulug town is one of the most critical areas being monitored by the Cagayan PDRRMO where more than 50 houses got a wash off due to flash floods brought about by Tropical Depression Kiel. According to the Municipal Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Office in Gonzaga, Cagayan and some residents, Tropical Storm Ramon is not as destructive compared with the previous typhoons Lawing and Ampong. May mga matigas talaga. Uh, they, uh, they told us, they, they know, alam nila ang gagawin. But still, we insist na kailangan na talagang may mga, especially itong karuan, na kailangan talaga nating i-evacuate sila. So, dahil matigas sila, so I insisted na yung mga babae, yung mga buntis, matatanda, mga bata. Meanwhile, more than 1,700 families living in low-lying and landslide-prone areas have been evacuated. Of them, more than 100 families are temporarily staying in an evacuation center in Gonzaga, Cagayan. Okay lang naman, ma'am. Kasi ma'am, pag ganito na ma'am, binibigyan kami kaagad ng pagkain. Hindi, ka na, hindi, ka namin, hindi, ka, hindi kami pinapabayaan dito, ma'am. Maganda naman ma'am ang ano nila sa amin. Maayos naman ma'am dito kasi inaasikaso kami talaga. As of now, the towns of Santa Ana and Gonzaga have no power supply. The provincial government has yet to announce class suspension for tomorrow. John Ano, UNTV News and Rescue, Gonzaga, Cagayan. Authorities in Bukidnon province are now conducting damage assessment following a 5.9 magnitude earthquake on Monday night. Janice Sanyeta tells us why. At least four persons were injured following a 5.9 magnitude earthquake which jolted Bukidnon province at 9.22 p.m. on Monday. According to Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology or FIVOX, the earthquake's epicenter was Cadinilan Town. FIVOX has recorded more than 30 aftershocks as of today. Around 100 houses have been reportedly damaged in different barangays in Cadinilan, including a health center and the municipal hall. Residents in Bukidnon have put up tents outside their homes to stay safe. Classes are suspended in all levels, both public and private schools, while work in government offices remain open. Authorities are now conducting damage assessment to ensure the safety of the residents. Meanwhile, in Makilala, Cotabato, evacuees feel calm whenever an earthquake strikes. They say despite the ground shaking, they are now in safe areas. Janice Enhente, UNTV, News and Rescue. Typhoon Ramon is moving almost stationary as it affects most parts of northern Luzon. As of 4 p.m. today, the eye of the cyclone was located at 120 kilometers east of Kalayan, Cagayan, packing with maximum sustained winds of 120 kilometers per hour and gustiness of up to 165 kilometers per hour. Tropical cyclone wind signal number three is raised over northern portion of Cagayan, particularly Santa Praxedes, Claveria, Sanchez Mira, Pamplona, Abulu Balesteros, Apari, Kalayan, Kamalinigan, Bagway, Santa Teresita, Gonzaga, and Santa Ana. Signal number two is raised over Batanes, Apayao, Kalinga, Apra, Ilocos Norte, Ilocos Sur, and the rest of Cagayan. While signal number one is raised over Mountain Province, Benguet, Ifugao, La Union, Pangasinan, and northern portion of Isabela, particularly Santa Maria, San Pablo, Moconacon, Cabagan, Santo Tomas, Quezon, Delphine Albano, Tamalini, Divilacan, Quirino, Rojas, Malig, San Manuel, Burgos, Gamu, and Ilagan City. Heavy rains will continue to be experienced in Cagayan, Isabela, Apayao, Ifugao, Ilocos Norte, Ilocos Sur, Abra, La Union, Pangasinan, and Mountain Province. Meanwhile, the low-pressure area inside Par has developed into a tropical depression and is named Sara. It is also forecast to affect northern Luzon this weekend. Basic toilet facilities should be a necessity for every Filipino household, more than having mobile phones. However, about 6 million Filipinos lack toilet facilities. With this, the Philippine government targets zero open defecation in the country by the year 2022. 
Asher Kadapan Jr. tells us why. Philemon Oxebio has been living in a shanty with his wife and six children in Baseco Compound, Tondo, Manila City. Due to poverty, he has not been able to provide a toilet for his family. Mahirap nga eh, ano lang eh. Misan doon sa araw, bawal naman doon na sa dagat umano eh. Pinagbawalan na doon ng mga bata mo gano'n. Si Ar, ano lang dito sa ano. Balot na lang. According to the Department of Health or DOH, about 6 million Filipinos still practice open defecation. Having no toilet is detrimental to the environment and causes water contamination of the sewerage system. It may also pose health risks to the community like diarrhea, cholera, and polio-causing virus based on a result of a recent test on a port area. Yung problema pong nakuha po doon sa polio, actually sa wastewater, ay dito po sa, sa Metro Manila. At pwede rin po inangganing po sa daluyan po magmula po dito sa Baseco. According to Senator Cynthia Villar, the number of toilets needed to be built as of now reaches 700,000 and costs about 14 billion pesos. Government projects to resolve the issue have been set in place, especially in depressed areas, but there is not enough fund to sustain them. Eh kasi yung mga mahihirap, wala sila talaga silang toilet. So we have to provide toilet facilities for them. Otherwise, kahit ang laki-laki ng gastos natin sa health benefits, pag walang toilet, edi eh sakit din ang sakit kasi yung hygiene ang may problema. Local governments in Metro Manila vow to help in keeping their communities clean and provide toilet for their constituents who don't have it. The DOH targets zero open defecation in the country by the year 2022. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue, City of Manila. Members of Bible Readers or Bread Society International visited a jail facility in Pangasinan and a community of indigent families in Bataan. Bread members also gave away gifts to sweet dwellers in other parts of the country. Nina Armilio has this report. The Bible Readers, or Bread Society International, continues to celebrate its 21st founding anniversary this month through various charitable works not only in school campuses but also in jail facilities and indigent communities. In Alas Asin Maribeles, Bataan, Bread members visited a village of indigent families and street dwellers on November 2. They gave away gifts including grocery and food items. In Dasmarina City, Bread Society Society Cavite distributed gift packs to street dwellers last November 4. In San Ildefonso High School, Bulacan, indigent students gathered to have fun and entertainment in a get-together on November 11. Bread members also gave them gifts to bring home for themselves and their families. In Manila, PUP students and other commuters saved a few pesos for riding a tricycle from Puresa to PUP main campus through Bread PUP Manila Chapter's Libreng Sakai sa Tricycle Project. And in Pangasinan, more than 60 persons deprived of liberty or PDLs in Urdaneta City Jail attended a stress management symposium through Bread's Dalo Prison Project. The symposium aimed to ease the grief of the PDLs. Bread Society also imparted words of God from the Bible, which will serve as their guide to avoid depression. Natuto po kami ng stress pala ay hindi dapat gawin para ang problema sa buhay. Harapin mo ng matiwasay na siyempre may pananalig ka sa Panginoon. Sa Bread Society, dahil salamat po dahil unang-una po, ito lang po yung uh, kauna-unahang pagkakataon na nagkaroon po kami ng stress management seminar po na pinauna po namin sa mga PDL namin na sila po yung unang-unang nangangailangan po. The Bread Society say they will continue to create partnerships with geriatrics and prisoners of law to fulfill biblical virtues. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. And to complete the most significant news for this day, Y News continues. Here are the top stories. Vice President Lenny Robredo met with the Department of the Interior and Local Government today. One of the points she reiterated she is not after a cabinet member position, but work. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. 
During her meeting with officials of the Department of the Interior and local government, Vice President Lenny Robredo emphasized the importance of capacity building and funding the Anti-Drug Abuse Councils or ADAC of local government units. VP Robredo said it is needed for the ADAC to perform their responsibilities to the government's drug war, especially on the community-based rehabilitation. The Vice President also stressed the importance of the Philippine National Police and the DILG in curbing drug supply and demand reduction. Meanwhile, during her visit in a barangay in Avote City, VP Robredo reiterated she is not after a cabinet member position. The VP said she will perform her role as an ICAD co-chair although she is not a member of the President's cabinet. On the list of high-value targets of the drug war, VP Robredo said it is up to the other agencies if they would give her access to it. The Vice President assures she will do what she can to get complete information on the drug war in order to make new policies and necessary action. In the event the HVT list is not given to her, Vice President Robredo said she will make do with what she has just like what she has always been doing. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News & Rescue, Navota City Meanwhile, Manila Mayor Isco Moreno Domagoso vows to file a legal action against those who will vandalize the city. This as Panday Sining strikes again. Bernard Dadis explains why. Tingnan niyo kung gaano kahirap. Yan, yan. Ito gusto niyo sa gobyerno. Ito gusto niyo pagkaabalahan namin. Mike. Imbis na pagkaabalahan namin kung paano namin kayo bibigyan ng bahay, kung yeah. paano namin kayo bibigyan ng trabaho. This is how Manila Mayor Isko Moreno Dumagoso condemns the youth activist group responsible for vandalizing Lagustilad underpass. The city mayor said the public fund used to repaint the vandalized area could have been used to buy medicines instead. Dumagoso bounced to find a legal action against those that will vandalize Manila City. But despite the warning, Panday Sining struck again and painted the walls of Araulio High School. Students volunteered to repaint their school's wall to cover what the youth activist group calls art. Para po sa akin, hindi po tama yung ginagawa nilang ganyang, sinasabi po nilang ganyang art. Kasi po, kung art po ang tawag dyan, pwede naman po natin gawin yung art sa mga iba't ibang klase ng mga papel. Dumilang sa pader yan. Eskwela ka pa. Saka gumagawa yung mga nag-rally lang. Sana wag na nila dumihan yung pader. Sana naman kinalaman yung pader sa gobyerno eh. Sana hindi nila ito ginagawa kasi nga nakakadumi ito sa ating kapaligiran. Tsaka... Ano, mapamit po yung Maynila, mapapo yung Maynila pagkagano. Mayor Isko has earlier warned Panday Sining after vandalizing the Lagustilad underpass. Huwag kayong panghuli sa akin. Pag nahuli ko kayo, padidila ko sa inyo ito. In response, Panday Sining released a statement on Sunday saying they are ready to leak their work to wipe off their writings. If those who challenge them are also willing to leak or stick their face to the ground where the masses set foot. In Manila City, there is an existing ordinance number 7971 or the Anti-Vandalism Law of 1999 which states that it is prohibited to paint or write on walls, fences, gates and buildings whether private or public except when done with the consent and authority of the owner or when duly authorized by the mayor. Violators shall face a fine of not less than 1,000 pesos but not more than 5,000 pesos or not less than 6 months nor more than 1 year or both fines and imprisonment at the discretion of the court. Bernard Daddy's UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. United States Secretary of Defense Mark Esper is visiting the Philippines, his next stop after his visits in South Korea and Thailand last weekend. He held a bilateral meeting with his Philippine counterpart, Defense Secretary Delphine Lorenzana, today. Harleen Delgado tells us why. United States Secretary of Defense Dr. Mark T. Esper is now in the Philippines with the aim to advance the seven-year alliance between the two countries. Earlier today, he paid his respects to the 17,000 fallen American soldiers during the Second World War at the Manila American Cemetery. He later met with Secretary Delphine Lorenzana at the national headquarters of the Department of National Defense in Camp Aguinaldo in Quezon City, where they discussed the strengthening of defense cooperation. 
operation. Secretary Esper emphasized it is important to uphold freedom of navigation, assert the country's rights, and to comply with international laws and rules, especially China. The U.S. official revealed during the ASEAN Defense Minister's meeting plus sustainable security in Thailand, most of the member nations expressed concern over China's excessive claims in the region and lack of compliance with international norms. The clear signal we're trying to send is not that we oppose China per se, but that we all stand for international rules, international laws, and that we think China should abide by them as well. And that uh, acting collectively is the best way to send that message and to get China on the right path. Secretary Esper also expressed openness in revisiting the decades-old mutual defense treaty, as proposed by Defense Secretary Delphine Lorenzana. Because in my opinion, it has been it has been made in 1951 at the height of the Korean War, and the situation then compared to now uh, is different. So we are actually in uh, discussion, the low-level discussion first. For all those reasons, it's good to do so, and I think the fact that we are such strong and capable allies, and there's such a great friendship between our militaries and our peoples, that uh, this is something we do together, and um, I, I look forward to, uh, to, to meeting and discussing this further. The U.S. also vows to support the modernization of the armed forces of the Philippines and their counter-terrorism efforts. Secretary Asper will soon head for Vietnam as part of his Indo-Pacific tour. Harleen Delgado, UN TV News and Rescue Camp Aguinaldo. A senior Trump administration has resigned from her position after reports emerged that she inflated her resume with several misleading claims about her education, professional background, and nonprofit work. Politico reported on Monday. Nina Chang, the 35 year old Deputy Assistant Secretary in the State Department's Bureau of Conflict and Stability Operations, was accused last week of falsely claiming she was a Harvard Business School graduate, exaggerating the extent of her nonprofit's work, and even creating a fake Time magazine cover of her face on it. Chang rebutted the allegations made public in an NBC story claiming she did not overstate her academic credentials and did not commission the doctored Time cover. Chang, who started her position in April, slammed the State Department for not defending her against reports she made up a role on a United Nations panel. And for the news abroad, here's Kath Dumaraos reporting live from Bangkok, Thailand. Kath, good evening. Good evening, William. Police tightened their siege of a university campus where hundreds of protesters remained trapped overnight in the latest dramatic episodes and months of protest against growing Chinese control over the semi-autonomous city. Ferdi Petalio reports. About 100 anti-government protesters remained holed up at a Hong Kong University Tuesday as a police siege of the campus entered its third day. City leader Carrie Lam said 600 people had left the Hong Kong Polytechnic campus, including 200 who are under 18 years old. Police have surrounded the university and are arresting anyone who leaves. Group of protesters made several attempts to escape Monday, including sliding down hoses to waiting motorcycles. But it wasn't clear if they evaded arrest. Lam said those under 18 would not be immediately arrested, but could face charges later. She said the other 400 who have left have been arrested. After five months, the Hong Kong protest movement has steadily intensified as local and Beijing authorities hardened their positions and refused to make concessions. Universities became the latest battleground last week as protesters occupied several campuses using gasoline bombs and bows and arrows to fend off riot police backed by armored cars and water cannon. Those at Polytechnic are the last holdouts. China, which took control of the former British colony in 1997, promising to let it retain considerable autonomy, flexed its muscle, sending troops outside their barracks over the weekend to help clean up debris strewn by protesters to block streets. Ferdi Petalio, UNTV News and Rescue, Hong Kong.
People in Sydney woke up to a city shrouded in smoke as course of bushfires rage across the region. Strong winds overnight brought smoke from fires inland, pushing the air quality in Australia's largest city to beyond hazardous levels. Locals have described hazy skies and the stench of smoke in their homes. About 5 million people live in the state capital of New South Wales, which has been affected for weeks by fires. Six people have died in bushfires in the state north since October. October. The U.S. government announced on Monday a new 90-day extension to allow China's Huawei Technologies Company Limited to continue doing business with U.S. firms as regulators in Washington continue to draft rules and regulations for telecommunications firms that are deemed, deemed to pose risks to national security. The latest extension, which will expire in February 2020, is for the same 90-day period as the one announced in August, and this is the third time that Washington has postponed its decision to prohibit U.S. firms from doing business with Huawei after the turmoil caused in the tech sector when the move was first announced in May. Although Huawei's market share for mobile telephones in the U.S. is very small, less than 1%, according to the most recent figures compiled by StatCounter, the Chinese firm has a strong presence as a provider of telecom equipment in rural areas. Two people have been killed after a suspension bridge over a river in southwest France collapsed. Meanwhile, the leader of North Korea is not interested in another meeting with Donald Trump, even though the American recently signaled they would be coming together soon. Jovic Burmas details why. In North Korea. North Korea said on Monday that it was not interested in holding any more fruitless summits with the United States, whom it urged to abandon its hostile policy in order for bilateral talks to advance. The comment by senior North Korean official Kim Kye-gwan, who is a former vice foreign minister, came after Trump on Sunday called on North Korean leader Kim Jong-un to act quickly and hinted at another meeting. Kim Kye-gwan, in a statement on North Korea's official KCNA news agency, said he had seen Trump's tweet but little had improved despite three meetings between the two leaders since June last year. It was the second time in less than a week that North Korean statements have taken direct aim at Trump, something Pyongyang had avoided since the two sides resumed a largely unproductive process of dialogue in 2018. In France, a 15-year-old girl and a truck driver were killed when a suspension bridge collapsed in southwestern France. Two vehicles fell into the river Tarn north of Toulouse when the bridge near the village of Melepois or Tarn fell down. Five people were also seriously injured, including two rescuers and local people who had tried to save victims. An investigation has been opened. There has long been concern at the state of the country's bridges. And in Brazil, the Amazon rainforest in Brazil lost 9,762 square kilometers of its area between August 2018 and July 2019, the highest degree of deforestation since 2008. The deforestation rate between August 2018 and July 2019 was 29.5% higher than in the same period of the previous year, according to official data of the state-operated National Institute for Space Research or INPE. The Brazilian president considered the data released by the state agency as false and, in his opinion, were released in bad faith by government officials whose political interests were in line with harming both Brazil and its government. Jovic Bermasio and TV News and Rescue. And those are the news from the other parts of the globe. Back to you, William. Thank you, Kath Dumaraos, reporting live from Bangkok, Thailand. The Old Path program celebrates its 39th anniversary. 
Members Church of God International or MCGI gave away free winter jackets at the Cornerstone community in the USA. Broad Chris De Leon reports. Because our Father, and I mean all of our Father, God Himself, would definitely bless you for that. And, and to ask me that, I am truly a child of God's. I'm not perfect, there's no five stars on me, but um, that's a wonderful thing that you're doing. This is Renee's reaction, one of the homeless in Chicago after receiving a free winter jacket during the nationwide coat drive held by the Members Church of God International this month in United States and Canada. According to the Department of Health of Illinois, over 200 deaths were recorded in the city and nearby places due to winter-related cases last year. According to Lida, a volunteer coordinator of Cornerstone Community Outreach, these free jackets are given by the MCGI to the community greatly help to avoid these winter-related death incidents especially of the poor kids affected by the winter season. That is definitely a risk, um, especially as the weather gets colder. Many times uh, people are, um, you know, they're, they're not adequately dressed. And so really uh, the donation of coats and, and that that you guys brought will really help to ensure that our clients will not freeze. You know, especially the kids who are going to school back and forth. Lida also thanked the group for supporting the outreach annually, especially during winter season. Well, thank you. First of all, I want to thank you all so much uh, to Brother Ellie and Brother Daniel. Uh, we greatly, greatly appreciate it. And I think it has been such a, a treasure and a blessing for our clients for you to come out on this third year in a row that you've come and you know provided such scrumptious goodies and fresh coffee from a Starbucks no less as well as the generous donations of your congregation and we greatly greatly appreciate it thank you thank you so much aside from the coat drives MCGI also conducted different public services this year here in Chicago like blood Letting drives, tree planting, as well as cleanup drives. The group aims to continue and strengthen these programs in the next coming months. From Chicago, USA of North America, Brother Chris DeLeon for the Old Path 39th anniversary, upholding the truth through the gospel and good works. President Rodrigo Duterte will be having a press conference with the media tonight at 9 o'clock. Stand by for our live streaming via our Facebook page, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the reasons behind the news this November 19, 2019. On behalf of Alex Baltazar and Angelo Castro III, I am William Theo. And before we close, we will recap with today's significant sound bites. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening. She made missteps, if I may call it that registered red signs that cannot be ignored by the president. I think the president uh, was referring to the previous leadership of uh, the POC. And uh, yun po yung sinasabi ko na uh, allergic siya. The clear signal we're trying to send is not that we op oppose China per se, but that we all stand for international rules and international laws, and that we think China should abide by them as well, and that uh, acting collectively is the best way to send that message and to get China on the right path. Ito gusto ninyo sa gobyerno? Ito gusto ninyo pagkaabalaan namin? Mike, Mike! Imbis na pagkaabalaan namin kung paano namin kayo bibigyan ng bahay, kung paano namin kayo bibigyan ng trabaho. Lumilang sa pader yan. Skwela ang ba? I think it's important to, to stay positive and look at that light at the end of the tunnel. No matter what, there's always going to be someone there to reach out to. You know, I'm pretty thankful for the support around the world.